I'm uh, Bunny Ellerin, and I am the uh, co-founder and president of New York City Health Business Leaders. And today we are going to be talking about telehealth, uh, which was the absolute breakout star of COVID-19. Um, and we'll be talking about where things are with it today. And, and as, as we say in the title, how rosy really is, is the future. All right, so now I want to bring in our moderator and our panelists. Okay, um, so our, uh, our moderator for today is uh, Linda Malik, who is a partner at Moses and & Singer and chair of the firm's healthcare and privacy cybersecurity practice. Um, her practice uh, concentrates on regulatory technology and business. Linda also is chair of the Health Law and Policy Coordinating Committee of the Health Law Section of the American Bar Association. Um, and she has been appointed to the founding board of the newest division of the National Board of Trial Advocacy called the National Board of Health Lawyers. As we can, lawyers love lots of really long titles. I grew up with them, so I know. But all of this is to say that um, Linda is a true um, healthcare expert, especially in this area of telehealth. And uh, she's a big reason why this particular event came about. So. Linda, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna say goodbye. I mean, I'll be watching, but take it away. Thank you so much, Bunny, and good afternoon to everyone. I, I'm really looking forward to this panel because so much has happened over the last seven, eight months with respect to telehealth. And we have a really wonderful group of people joining me who have been in the middle of all of it. And we're going to be talking about um, a, a variety of themes today, including where we, you know, what we've experienced during the pandemic in the context of telehealth, but also, and most importantly, some of the challenges ahead and where we see telehealth going. Um, I will introduce our panelists. We have Melinda Barnes, who is the uh, SVP Hi. of Medical Affairs and Research at Roe. Uh, and she serves as the clinical director for L Rose, a fairly newly launched uh, women's health vertical uh, called Rory. And we have uh, Eve DeRusso, who is the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Lenox Hill Hospital here in the city. Uh, Laurel Pickering, who is the executive vice president uh, for enterprise solutions for WellDoc. And many of you likely know her from her uh, tenure at the New York Business Group on Health. And joining us a little bit later will be Amanda Parsons, who is the Chief, Deputy Chief Medical Director for Metro Plus Health Plan. Um, and with that, I'd like to go through and have each of our panelists talk a little bit more about their work in the telehealth arena. Um, Melinda, should we go ahead and start with you? Sure. Benefits of the last name Barnes, I'm usually first. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Um, very excited to, to participate on the panel and talk a little bit more about Roe. Um, we are a digital health company. We power three digital health clinics. So Roman for men's health, Rory for women's health, and Zero for smoking cessation. Uh, in addition to our digital health clinics, we also have a network of digital pharmacies. Uh, so we have six pharmacies throughout the country. Um, we provide services in all 50 states plus DC. Um, so we are a telemedicine first company um, and we handle everything from diagnosis to delivery of medication. So we have, um, we write our own online visits for our symptom specific conditions. Uh, we work with an affiliated network of providers that evaluate and see the patients on the platform. And then we have the pharmacy for delivery of medication to patients should they elect to have uh, the medication shipped to them through our pharmacies. Um, and we also have a new uh, service line called Row Pharmacy, which is our $5 pharmacy. We have over 500 generic medications, um, each $5 for a month supply. Um, I think we're unique in that we are 100% cash pay. That's on the provider side and the medication side. So we do not um, adjudicate any insurance. So that $5 row pharmacy is 
uh, no copay, just $5 total. Um, and our doctor's visit is $15 for patients. And Eve, why don't we go to you next? Welcome, thank you uh, for having me uh, for this wonderful event. So I'm Eve DeRosa, I'm the chair of the emergency department at Lenox Hill Hospital, which is part of Northwell Health, uh, which is a large uh, healthcare uh, network of 20 plus hospitals here uh, in New York City. Uh, we've had several use cases for uh, telemedicine. In the past, uh, we've uh, done uh, telepsychiatry, telestroke, uh, tele-ICU, um, telehospitals, teletrauma, et cetera. But um, COVID has really forced us uh, to look at all our use cases. And for me specifically, we started to look at how we could leverage our services in the emergency department uh, to really uh, keep uh, capacity in our ERs for COVID patients and take care of patients uh, from afar uh, who we could do so safely. So I'll be expanding on that uh, as we move on, but thank you. Thanks, Eve. And, and Laurel, do you wanna talk about your work with WellDoc in the context of telehealth? Yeah, sure. And while we're talking about telehealth, you know, telehealth is really part of a broader category of virtual health, with, which is now really becoming the norm due to COVID. And digital health is part of that. And at WellDoc, we provide digital solutions for chronic disease management that are focused on helping users self-manage their conditions, mostly using smartphones. And you know, at the same time that we're helping the users self-manage, we are able to provide data back to the doctor and the care team, which gives insights on patients in between those visits. So it's both about augmenting current care but about extending the reach of care using digital coaching and digital care teams. And we are in the areas of diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, prediabetes, and soon to be behavioral health and gestational uh, diabetes. And you know, I also wanna note that these are not just apps. We are able to see significant improvement in outcomes with solutions like ours which is really where the rubber meets the road, right? It's about you know, meeting people where they are and improving their quality of life. So WellDoc sits so squarely in that digital health solution um, area and um, excited to talk about what we're doing today. Thanks, Laurel. Um, I wanna explore a little bit more about what each of you have seen in the context of the COVID pandemic and how your work in telehealth has shifted and changed. And, I know that for each of you, um, remote monitoring, care management, those types of things are part and parcel of what you do in the telehealth context. Um, Eve, I wanna start with you because certainly in the context of emergency medicine, um, it, it would be really helpful to know what, what was happening, what has been happening across the arc of the last seven months or so and, and what has changed in terms of your work in telehealth during the pandemic? So thank you for that. So for us, um, as you know, during the uh, March, April, we had the surge in COVID and our uh, EMS services, uh, where there were days where they were very much uh, overwhelmed. Uh, there was one particular, uh, I think the last Sunday of March where they had 6,000 or so calls, which was unprecedented. And uh, so what we've done at Northwell Health is we uh, leverage uh, our paramedic uh, services to be able to take the intakes, uh, take the calls. And some of those calls were actually converted appropriately to telemedicine. Um, so there was about a 25% conversion where we could actually take care of that patient uh, through telemedicine. Now, as you, you know, dig a little uh, more, sometimes they, they turn out not to be appropriate uh, such things as depending the patient may be calling you from the street and you don't necessarily know that the setting, there's a lot of factors uh, that have to be in place to complete that visit. But having said that, uh, during that time period, we were able to uh, manage about 300, uh, almost 400 patients actually uh, through uh, telemedicine that were converted in initially from 911 calls. So what that did was, you know, again, it gave us additional capacity to be able to manage the COVID patients. Um, and then the non-COVID uh, patients, or quite frankly, some COVID patients who weren't quite ill, uh, you know, at that moment, we didn't quite have testing. So based on their symptoms, we were able to tell them to stay in place and give them further instructions. Um, in some cases, 
uh, we uh, the patients needed to come to the ER and they were they, they were reluctant because they were afraid of of COVID if they didn't have that uh, condition. Um, and we would send a paramedic uh, to the home and use the paramedic then to do a telemedicine uh, conference call with a, a visit with uh, a clinician. Um, and so that was another layer uh, way of us uh, to, to manage uh, telemedicine. And then we, we started doing other use cases uh, with uh, telemedicine. Um, we, there were patients, sometimes we'd have them come back for follow-up care if they had a wound or something and we want to see how that wound is, is doing. Uh, during COVID, we actually use uh, telemedicine to f do that follow-up in two or three days. So they didn't have to return to the ED. We also followed some uh, COVID patients remotely who, uh, you know, with pulse ox monitors um, and we would just check in on them every day. And uh, we had, you know, successfully, a majority of those patients were able to stay home and, and, and recover from the home. So um, multiple uses of telemedicine, COVID has really pushed the envelope for us. Let's see. Um, Melinda, I want to ask you, in terms of the, the various types of care that Roe provides, um, what have you seen in, in the midst of the COVID pandemic and what has changed in the way that you guys provide care? Yeah, so uh, I'd say first, you know, we, when, when COVID first hit, I was on maternity leave and, um, you know, sitting at home and trying to figure out what could we do. We have this nationwide network of providers. We have um, patients who are already using us for asynchronous and synchronous uh, telemedicine. And so um, a team, a small team of us got together and put out the first free telehealth assessment for COVID. And we thought this is something that we can do. We can leverage technology. Right now, everyone's scared. No one knows what to look for. What are the symptoms? We, you know, there's not testing. We don't know if there will be treatment, but at least we could try to get um, some information. And so we were able to partner with over uh, 50 different um, businesses to provide them co-branded uh, telehealth assessments. We worked with Uber. Um, they were sending their drivers uh, to the telehealth assessment to do it before they would log into shifts. And so we were really trying to find a way to leverage what we're good at, um, which is digitizing and standardizing uh, care across um, different virtual platforms. Um, and then also, you know, reaching out to patients and really meeting them at eye level, similar to what Laurel um, was stating in her intro. Um, what we've seen is increased demand from patients who are writing in to their providers for the conditions that we treat, asking if they can also treat them for something else. Um, and uh, we've also seen uh, in-person providers referring patients to Rome and Rory Zero um, to get care via our platform um, because they feel like it's you know, safe and appropriate for them. And that means that they have more time to see patients who need to be seen in person. Um, in terms of utilization, I'm just looking at some of the numbers I got. Um, we saw our stress supplement go up 50% month over month, sleep products up over a thousand percent month over month in terms of utilization. Smoking cessation um, evaluations went up 90% month over month. Um, Google traffic up 27% month over month for people looking specifically for Zero, Roman, and Rory. Uh, so patients were looking for ways to get trusted, safe, high quality care um, virtually. And I think one of the things that um, we do that allows for increased access is to offer telemedicine via asynchronous chat or the store and forward where patients can send a message to their provider and get a message back um, or video or phone depending on state laws and patient provider preference. Um, and so that means that patients really can reach out to a, to a physician when it is best for them. If that's in between you know, jobs or after you put the kids to bed, they're not restricted to the nine to five normal business hours of in-person care or even the typical hours in which you would do video visits. Um, so it's been very interesting. It's been very busy. Um, we have even more uh, conditions coming out the rest of this year, really trying to meet the needs of, of our patients. So there, there are a couple of themes there that you raised that I want to dig into a little bit more. One is with respect to um, 
really the what sounds almost like uh, a triaging where certain types of visits lend themselves to remote care and remote monitoring for you know a particular condition that doesn't necessarily need to be an in-person visit so that doctors can uh, see patients in person uh, where it's really necessary. Um, and, then, and then the other being uh, an expansion in terms of certain wellness type uh, uh, solutions that improve quality of life overall. And I, I actually, I wanna ask Laurel about this a little bit in terms of the WellDoc um, uh, solutions that you have, because it, I, I'm interested in hearing during, during the COVID uh, pandemic, what, what have you found with respect particularly to um, the use of your platforms by patients that might have gone you know, to a doctor for some of this? Are you seeing more reliance on, on these platforms and less reliance on in-person visits? How, how has that kind of played out? Yeah, so the answer is yes, and I, would, and I would really answer that two ways. One is we have seen a lot more interest in our solution. So everyone is seeming to realize that they need digital solutions to either engage their employees, if they're an employer, their members, if they're a health plan, or their patients, if they're a provider. You know, and before COVID, we really saw employers leading this charge around digital solutions, you know, with health plans starting to step up. Um, and even though we were knocking on the doors of providers, you know, not as many were responding, but COVID has really pushed providers to recognize that we need to literally, and Ro just said it as well, you know, meet patients where they are. And now providers are faced with getting a digital strategy and really getting it fast, just for the reasons that you stated, Linda, that they want to be able to provide for their members, their patients, alternative ways to manage care. And then from a user perspective, we have seen an increase in, in usage, right? And engagement in our solutions. So, you know, we have, a, we have multiple features from being able to check your blood glucose and your blood pressure, to, you know, count your calories, or to we have a feature where you can uh, plan a meal and have it delivered to your door all through the app. So we have seen just a tremendous increase in usage of of our solutions as a result of COVID. So it's both like more enterprises coming to us because they see the need for their customers, their patients, but then also more usage within our solutions themselves. So it really all increased when COVID hit. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I wanna pivot for a minute to reimbursement for all of this. And in the last couple of days, CMS announced a broadening of reimbursement for various telehealth uh, activities, and which is great news. Um, hopefully the states will follow suit and, and um, there will be less of a patchwork with respect to reimbursement. But what I want to ask all of you about is, um, you know, the extent to which you think reimbursement is a real driver um, with respect to increased use of telehealth going forward. And I, I want to start with Melinda because you have such a unique model in terms of really being a cash-based model. And so um, reimbursement, I would think, is not really much of a driver for you. And that may be something that is slightly different with respect to some of the others. So let's start with you in terms of your view on this. Absolutely. I think that reimbursement uh, yeah, is, is not necessarily a driver for us and because we're not uh, adjudicating any insurance, we're not working with any payers. But I would say what is a driver are the increased rates of co-insurance, co-payments, high uh, deductible plans. The out-of-pocket costs that patients are having to pay for their health care is making solutions like Roe even more attractive because our uh, doctor's visit of $15 is less than most primary care and specialty care co-payments. Um, with us, our only customer really is the patient. And so if we're not providing value to them, they're not going to come to us. So all of our innovations, all of our strategies, everything that we obsess over is not how to get codes reimbursed, but how do we continue to add value to this patient's life? And so if that 
means making uh, things that seem small but are huge, making our website mobile friendly, making the online visit an easy to understand language, um, making sure that we have things like structured medication so patients don't have to remember how to spell their medication. They can start typing it and we can auto fill it in. Um, being able to allow patients who are not even our members to go through the $5 pharmacy. You can have your doctor call a prescription into the $5 pharmacy, or you can call us and we will call the pharmacy and do all of the complexity of transferring that prescription over so that you can get the medication to you. Um, I think when we look at the numbers, 12 million people have lost their health insurance already because they've lost their jobs. And that's, you know, as of August of 2020. So we need to think about alternative ways to deliver high quality and safe health care to patients that does not rely on employer-based insurance um, and provide patients with some kind of empowerment and autonomy. When we put whoever is paying the bill or shelling out the money, they hold the power. And when you have a payer-based system, it's not the patient. Um, and so if you have a cash-based system, it is the patient. And so we can really look to increase quality, which is making sure that patients get their desired health outcome. And that's why we like to call ourselves telehealth. Um, it is wellness, it is medicine, it is prevention, it's vaccines, it's everything, it's screening. Um, and so we've started with the conditions that we have right now, but our ultimate goal really is to be a patient's first call and to develop a healthcare system um, and a healthcare delivery uh, ecosystem that can live outside of uh, the payer world. Thanks, Melinda. Um, so moving a little bit more to the kind of traditional healthcare delivery context and um, interfacing and interweaving telehealth into that, Eve, I wanted to ask you about this because what you've described with respect to incorporating telehealth into emergency room visits um, kind of sounds like a continuum of care in the emergency context where you've used telehealth to, um, to help supplement and, and uh, make the emergency room uh, visits more efficient you know, to the extent, again, from a triage perspective, even to the extent that there are certain patients that aren't going to get seen quickly in an emergency room. But from a reimbursement perspective, how, how have you all approached this? And has it been a consideration? And if so, how, how have you evaluated it? So this is a, a lot to unpack here. Um, I would say that in a perfect world, starting from scratch, uh, Melinda's model is, is correct. Um, it's, it's all based on, on value. Um, we are legacy. We are your traditional bricks and mortars. Um, and our model is mostly fee-for-service right now. Uh, we are moving to an era of value-based purchasing. And I think in that era, there, there will be a, uh, a play for telemedicine that's not necessarily reimbursed that may just be part of the cost of doing business. For example, we don't line itemize and charge for the use of our stethoscope. It's just a tool uh, that we use to assess and take care of the patient. And we, we have done that. So it's, um, you know, what I described in tell, if you take a look at tele ICU that we've done, uh, that really is, wasn't a mechanism for reimbursement. That was really to augment care. So really the, the idea is no matter what door you walk into in Northwell Health, be it a community or tertiary care hospital, you will get the same level of expert care. Um, it was also a way to uh, help us follow trends in data. If a patient's getting sicker, uh, that person who's monitoring may see that much faster than the person who's actually uh, by the bedside and running around seeing multiple patients. So it's really a safety net mechanism and for those um, use cases, we don't necessarily look for reimbursement. We just believe that it is the right thing to keep the patient safe. Um, and it also adds standardization of care because when you set these things in place, you have to have certain protocols. So, you know, the person who's monitoring that patient at Forest Hills has to have, be following the same uh, protocols as if they're following them at Lenox Hill. So it's really added to the standard of care. Um, but there are, are cases um, in which we, we do try. We have our managed care um, department that is aggressively negotiating with payers 
uh, for, for, for parity uh, in terms of payment. Um, is parity the right thing? That's a controversial thing. Or, or should it be equity? Because folks will say, well, that cost uh, of, of, of doing business for that patient may not be the same as a traditional visit. So th these are all things that are being negotiated that have not been settled yet. Um, but I think that um, they, they have to be. The, the, the last piece I'll, I'll say is about fraud, right? So we don't want, there is a real concern that if you make telemedicine too easy, I'll give you an example. I saw a patient in urgent care this weekend who literally got stung by an insect, bitten by an insect a block away. He happens to walk in front of the urgent care and he decides, let me walk in and get this checked out. Um, there was really no barrier to, to you know, stop him from doing that, to consider maybe I should just get some hydrocortisone, maybe try something, see how it gets better. So, you know, I say this because telemedicine, you don't want to make it so easy um, that there's no barriers that, you know, providers may actually use this for indications that are not necessarily, and vice versa, patients may um, use this in ways that uh, are, are not uh, appropriate necessarily. Thanks, Eve. And, and Laurel, you also are in a, a fairly unique um, paradigm with respect to the services and platforms that you provide and reimbursement. So how, how much is reimbursement a, a part of this and how much of a driver do you see it being? Yeah, it's a huge driver, Linda. I mean, reimbursement has to evolve to pay for all these solutions. Yeah. And, you know, I know it is kind of controversial, but I do believe that we want to provide the same incentives for providers to see people remotely versus in person, or this all falls apart and we go back to our old ways. So it has to evolve and it's critical to this. Um, and Eve's brought it up. I mean, health plans and employers certainly play a large role in this. And you know, with COVID, we saw health plans changing a lot of things around reimbursement to help with um, getting services to people that need them. And that really does need to continue. I think I have actually seen that there's been some pullback even, but that's where there, this can't be headed in that direction. And when we think about, you know, WellDoc and our services and digital health solutions, you know, we get paid directly from our clients who are health plans, health systems, and employers. Um, but for an enterprise to pay us, um, and Eves, you also just mentioned, you know, you have a fee for service situation. I mean, for us to get paid, our clients are usually in some kind of an at risk arrangement. They are on the hook for population health and they're being held accountable for outcomes and cost. So this has to evolve for people to, you know, for enterprises to pay for this for, um, for their patients and, you know, employees, members, et cetera. Um, one thing to note that's been very promising for us in the digital health space is that CMS now has remote monitoring codes that apply to digital solutions like ours, and they can be reimbursed by Medicare. So that is real progress. And, you know, we try to get the word out about that because I don't think a lot of providers especially know that they can use those codes to actually, you know, get reimbursed for solutions like ours. Right, and I think, I think you bring up some interesting points, Laurel, because as I said earlier, CMS is, is trying to move ahead and, and has recently announced an expansion. So, um, so that is some progress. And um, until you know, everybody gets to the row model, uh, we, we're, all, we're all really um, beholden to reimbursement in this context, and, and it is important. So. Um, so I think, I think it's important to note the reimbursement piece as a driver. Um, I want to move now to perhaps a more difficult issue, and that is issues around disparities in access to telehealth. Because in order to access telehealth, technology is a necessary component. And um, to the extent that there are income disparities, for example, that may limit access to technology or, um, and this is one of the questions that has come in, I'm, I'm just going to raise it now because it's relevant to what we're talking about at the moment, um, age disparities as well, because 
the elderly, for example, are perhaps not as facile with the technology as their younger counterparts. So um, I want to ask you about what your experiences have been in the context of, of this issue, disparities in access, what, what you've experienced and what you think possible solutions are to this. And um, Eve, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, this is, as you all know, COVID really unmasked a, a lot of the what's always been there in terms of uh, healthcare disparities. Um, you know, as a simple example, you know, when we said you know shelter in place, uh, the the key is not in place, but it's the shelter. So what is that shelter for the, the person we're speaking about? Is it a 500 square foot place with six people, or is it a 5,000 square foot place with uh, six people who can uh, separate and that that created problems that um, were you know uh, we didn't expect and uh, in certain pockets uh, for for example Queens and Brooklyn uh, we saw multi generational multi multiple people coming in at once with COVID because one person was a laborer had to was essential it worked and they came to the home and well shelter in place meant that everyone uh, became sick so you know COVID really exposed that so now I hope that we we have learned uh, from that and um, we don't uh, continue to replicate what we're doing. So, you know, uh, just basic uh, in thinking about this, I had a friend the other day who um, said that she cannot uh, down, she has to download the pictures off of her phone. And I said, that's, that's bizarre. I've never had to do that. Uh, and I realized maybe I was a little insensitive. My phone plan is unlimited. And hers is not. These, these are subtle little things and they sound funny, but we really have to think about our, our audience and what we're really offering them. Um, and it's, it's not equal across the board. So uh, telemedicine, all this technology in the world is not going to create an equal playing field. We still have to remember who our customer is and what their capabilities are and, um, and, and, and bridge those, those gaps. Um, in terms of the elderly, same thing. Um, you know, we learned as we were trying to do um, some of the aftercare, we wanted to, we're about to start to follow patient after hours um, through telemedicine. Well, if you ask someone to, to launch the application and then they have to download something, which some of the platforms are requiring, you might as well abort the mission. Um, so we have to also think about the technology, the user uh, interfaces, and, and all of those things, which are still unresolved. But if we don't fix those, we're just going to continue the disparities that we see. Thanks, Eve. And, and Belinda, I want to ask you about this as well, in terms of your view and what you've observed and, and kind of where we go. Yeah, I think that um, thinking about the patient experience down to the color of the buttons, the size of the font, um, is it mobile compatible? Um, how does someone get to the next question? Do they have to click a button? Does it automatically go to the next question once they answer? Do they need to um, uh, uh, swipe? Um, all of those things um, are, are things that we think about on our product design side um, and trying to make it as easy as possible. There are a lot of disparities and we, you know, we can't solve them all right now. One disparity is just how do we get the technology into the hands of people? And I think as technology gets lower priced, um, then we can, you know, address those things. Let's start with someone having the technology. Again, we make all of our interfaces mobile compatible, we don't want to have to make it a necessity for someone to have an iPad or a computer. You should be able to go through the online visit, speak with your provider, and do everything related to your care on your phone. Um, we talked about uh, age. So most people think that Roman and Rory are for millennials, but actually I think 12% of our patients are under the age of 30. Um, over 40% of our patients are over the age of 50. Um, and so the average age on Roman is around 48 years old. Um, we also, a lot of uh, tech companies make it extremely difficult for you to talk to someone live. You go online, you're trying to like get in touch with customer su support. It's a chat bot, it's a email us and we'll get back to you. Uh, we have a phone number and you, if you call it, you will speak to a live person and you'll speak to someone here in the United States um, and that's something that patients are always like 
thrown off when a real person picks up. And so we do a lot of walking patients through, here's how you open up the icon that says Chrome. Okay, click on that. Do you, do you see the empty white uh, you know, rectangle? Type in this address, click here. So we have customer support people who are walking people through um, how to use telemedicine or how to actually access the platform. The other thing too, in terms of access and disparities. So uh, I mentioned before about the timing of things. We have gig workers who an hour off or two hours or three hours to take off to go to the doctor is a difference between paying rent or buying food for their kids or how do they even uh, afford childcare to watch their children during this. So we thought about that in terms of where, you know, it's uh, uh, where we're able to do it. That's one of the biggest reasons why we have asynchronous telemedicine. So patients can go through the visit when they want. They can go through the visit, they can stop, their place is saved, they can come back onto the visit. So we really tried to think through um, different disparities and how we're addressing them in terms of people who may not have insurance, people who are not salaried and can take time off from work, uh, people who don't live um, on a transportation line to get to the hospital, but they can um, access um, telemedicine. The other thing I think to think about in terms of disparities is broadband. Uh, we did a study and we looked at it and uh, places where broadband speed is decreased, that does affect your access to care in terms of telemedicine only if video is mandated by your state. So if your state says that you have to use video to establish that patient provider relationship, you are um, restricting the access of the patients who need it the most um, if your broadband connectivity is low. If you have asynchronous or phone, then there's no uh, decrease in terms of utilization rates. So we also spend a lot of time reaching out to legislators, um, giving them information about our patients, um, letting them know what these laws and rules that seem like they don't affect patient care do indeed affect patient care. They affect utilization. You're trying to get access to patients in rural areas um, and if you're necessitating video and you have low broadband speed, you're actually hurting your patients more than helping them. Um, so yeah, I think that in terms of you know, disparities, there's a lot of things we like to focus on access, but we are very much aware of the fact that access is more than just getting people to the website, it's actually giving them the technology that they need to get there. Um, and then it's also thinking about every pain point and trying to solve for that along their um, patient experience. Go ahead, Eve. Linda, I just wanted to add to that point, um, uh, the privacy issue. I um, mean, I think we could all speak to it, but there is already a distrust in certain communities uh, with healthcare organizations and providers. And now when you add the privacy issues of technology, you know, someone will say, well, what's happening to this visit? Is it being recorded? What's going to happen to the data after? And that we have to be very transparent and clear about that. And the vendors have to um, be also pushed uh, to create that. We, we can't have uh, the Zoom, what do you call it, when, when folks uh, come into your Zoom calls, that, that just cannot happen uh, during a, a, a healthcare visit. Um, Zoom bomb. <laughs> it's uh, like Zoom bomb, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I think that's a really good point. There, there are a couple of good points here that I, I want to um, focus on. And um, let, me, let me start with what you just mentioned, Eve, about, about privacy, because uh, just to speak very briefly on that, we know that there has been um, some loosening of privacy restrictions by the federal government, by HHS, in order to try to accommodate um, an increased use of telehealth and to allow providers more flexibility in terms of being able to provide healthcare through telehealth platforms. That said, um, there is still uh, a concern about making sure that the platforms that are used are not public platforms, but are private platforms. And there are still rules around that that HHS has um, issued. And so it's not a free for all. And I think everyone is sensitive um, to that. And it will be interesting to see once this pandemic subsides and we are kind of in this new paradigm where there is increased use of telehealth uh, to see what HHS does in terms of whether it will go back right to where it was or whether it will also 
um, continue to allow for more flexibility while balancing these privacy issues. Um, another thing that, that I wanted to um, hone in on is, is, Melinda, what you were saying about the importance of being able to offer asynchronous care and monitoring too in order to be sensitive to um, hourly workers and that sort of thing. And I, and I wanna ask Laurel about that uh, with respect to WellDocs products. But before I do that, I wanna welcome Amanda. Um, I see you joined and good to see you. I wanted to ask you, Amanda, specifically in the context of disparities in healthcare, what you've seen with respect to perhaps insurance disparities and um, issues around perhaps wait times with respect to Medicaid recipients versus commercial insurance um, recipients and whether there are issues there because of particular doctors that may take one type of insurance versus another and, um, and, and whether there are solutions to that. Well, thank you so much. And I apologize for being late. And I wanted to say I'm not a Zoom bomber. <laughs> <That's> actually, <laughs> so <laughs> on the heels of ease, I thought I'll wait to be introduced. Otherwise, people might think I am. But uh, so hi, um, um, I've been working at Metro Plus for a year. We have a number of um, ways that we interact with telehealth. And so I'll speak from a couple of different experiences. Um, the first is the tele our own telehealth product that we ended up launching right in the midst, right at the beginning of COVID, where people uh, who are members of Metro Plus could, um, could reach out and get access to a program provider through um, our partner product with Amwell. And we've been we had a very successful launch of that great uptick, you know, the no better time to launch a telehealth platform than during COVID. Um, but what we did see, you know, fairly early on were just the, you know, a, a, a replication of the disparities that we see in face-to-face -face visits where, you know, as they broke out the wait times by line of business, you know, the wait times for the Medicaid line of business were, you know, were, have been pretty consistently higher than the other lines of business. And when, you know, pressed as to why, you know, the, the vendor was very clear with us that they, you know, just cannot find as many Medicaid providers on the platform, which is essentially the same problem that we have when we're talking about face-to-face -face visits. There just aren't as many providers who, um, who take Medicaid who are, um, who, and therefore you start to get the, you know, the, the, the bottleneck and the slowing. Um, I, where I do see the technology and, and telehealth be able to um, potentially uh, mitigate uh, some of the health disparities or help address them are through the asynchronous routes that you were just talking about. So for instance, um, for which there is not reimbursement yet, you know, like there's not wildly great models for a lot of the asynchronous um, work. But for instance, during the COVID crisis, we wanted to reach out to our members to make sure they knew where to get uh, and their questions answered for COVID, to, knew, to know where they could get emotional support, to let us know if they ran out of refills and couldn't get to um, a doctor, um, to let us know if they had any, you know, questions or concerns or needed to be connected to our telehealth provider. And in Interestingly, we saw the same thing that I think, Melinda, you mentioned, where our greatest um, engagement rate was actually in the 34 to 64 year olds. And in the less than 30 year olds, we actually didn't see very much engagement, which to me was like this frightening experience of like, oh my God, I'm in my 40s. And is text already a, like a passe platform to reach the younger generation? Like, must we have like a TikTok version of this or something? So there is this sense that like, as we, as medical, as the medical world, catches up to a platform like where is that platform still relevant in the like in the in some of the younger groups we we did see um, um and but we the way that we reached out is that it was like through a chat bot and they can activate the chat bot whenever we release the the, the 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 text messages during the day and we did get a fair amount of people who overnight would engage with the chat bot at midnight at one o'clock in the morning and let us know that they needed help and so there was you know for some of those um the places that we could refer them to those services were 24 7 for others they were more um you know for people who said they needed help with food or help with housing the staff was more of a daytime staff but they would 
would pick up every day, they would pick up messages from the people who had engaged with the chatbot after hours. And so I think if that had been a kind of a traditional face to face, they wouldn't have been able to. We did see that um, if the patients were Spanish speaking, they were far less likely to engage. And then interestingly, those who had high rates of inpatient and ED use were also 20 to 30% less likely to engage with a chatbot overall. Our rate of engagement with the, with the um, product that we built in partnership with um, Amazon Web Services was about 9% overall. We tracked it sort of like daily as we released these messages. And so there, I think there's a lot of opportunity in there, but there's, you know, obviously when we first started, as with almost every platform that I've seen, it's like, oh, we have the English only version ready to go. The Spanish one is like not far behind, right? But the Albanian one and the Croatian one is like nowhere in the, in the, in the, <laughs> nowhere to be found. And so I think those kinds of disparities, we, we need to figure out ways to make sure that we address more comprehensively. But I, I do think it's a promising, I do think it's promising. Um, the other issue I would make, I would just add around privacy is we talk a lot about the privacy and the security of the actual data at, during the transmission. One thing that we're seeing is people taking these calls from their homes. Sometimes that is a wonderful thing and others that in and of itself is a privacy concern because all of their other um, family members can hear and it's not always evident to our care managers and others that that's the case, right? And so we're asking questions and it's like the answers are a little, like they're not as direct. And then it's like, oh my God, that's right. They cannot answer this question potentially if they've got, you know, somebody else listening that they may not want to hear. And so also thinking about that aspect of privacy, which is different than when you're in, you know, one-on-one -on -one in a doctor's office, potentially with just you and your provider, you know, behind a closed door. So that's the only thing I would say about the privacy piece. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you all for, for the thoughtful responses. Um, I want to ask you as well, Laurel, what your experiences have been in the context of uh, disparities in healthcare and whether, you know, it, whether you think the asynchronous uh, model is something that works and that you've employed or more broadly, what your experience has been, what your solutions um, have been as well. Yeah, and I mean, I really think that digital solutions can be used to reduce disparities in healthcare. Because when we think about what 96% of people own a cell phone, 81% own a smartphone. And when you break that across races, there's not a lot of difference. Like 82% of white people have a smartphone, 80% 80, 80 of black people, 79% of Hispanics. And when you get to education level, it varies a little bit. But this is still a huge untapped market and population. And a lot of organizations that serve um, the underserved are not paying for smartphone solutions. And that is a technology that we have. You know, people probably spend maybe 60 minutes a year with a clinician between doctor visits, et cetera. Do you know how many hours they spend on their smartphone? 87,000 hours on their smartphone. So we really need to capitalize on this technology and use it to reduce disparities. I mean, I clearly have a horse in this race, obviously, but I've been watching this over the years and providers only see patients a couple of times a year. And because of that, we developed care management programs to do the things that doctors couldn't do. And, you know, as they've, they've had limitations, they've been in person, um, and we really need to capitalize on the technology that we have. I mean, we've done some work um, with New York City Health and Hospitals, and we worked with you know, low income, predominantly Medicaid, Spanish speaking populations, and we saw great results. We saw great engagement. We saw we were able to lower A1C. Um, so it was a tool that they had. Um, you know, a solution like ours, it works online and offline. So you don't have to be connected to the internet. You don't have to have that kind of bandwidth. And Rose's point was interesting. You know, you do need to have a phone number that people can call and someone picks up the phone, you know, and we have that too, so that they can get that personal touch. It's not a chat bot. I mean, there's a real person on the under end of that phone. That's very important. But so I, my, so the bottom line is I think these solutions, especially those on smartphones can be used to help with disparities um, and it's a very untapped market. Thanks, thanks Laurel and thanks to all of you. I do want to take a couple of minutes to uh, answer some questions. We've got quite a number of questions here and um, Bunny, I'll, I'll defer to you as to whether we can go live with these now. 
Yeah, um, if you pick one person, then I'll unmute them. Okay. Um, so the first one that, that I see here that we could go live with is from Peter Fritzhauf. And this is around um, telemedicine. I'll, I'll read out the question, um, Peter. How, how are telemedicine encountered encounters recorded in EHRs and patient portals and how are diagnosis and treatment recorded and is the data FHIR compliant? And Peter, I'll let you uh, expand on that question if you like. I, I think you covered it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I, I will pose this to the panel. Does anyone want to take, take this one? So um, we, so it's a very good question and it, a lot of it has to do, and we've learned um, the interfaces. So the vendors that create the telemedicine platforms don't necessarily provide you the, the EHR. And so uh, we had to basically, for lack of a better term, Jerry rig a lot of pieces together uh, to find uh, the, right, the right platform uh, to use with our, you know, what we're about to stand up in terms of our, our aftercare. Um, it's, it's not perfect. Um, we, you know, as a large care organization, we're going to use an EHR that has all the, you know, HIPAA and, and, and privacy uh, things in place. But then it also there's implications for, uh, for the user as the provider who's also trying to do this telemedicine visit. How light is that product in terms of them uh, documenting? Some, some folks use uh, supplement that with scribes. There's uh, different ways you could do it. And then also the billing. Uh, the billing is 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 different um, than we traditionally did in emergency medicine. The billing is more time based or activity based, et cetera. So we had to find the right EMR that would, um, you know, allow us to capture uh, as best as possible what we needed in terms of uh, uh, the billing. So very complex, um, and uh, every place does it a little differently. There's no one size fits all. So it's what works for your organization. Actually, I'll chime in. Um, uh, Peggy Hill um, s sent in a question. So Peggy, I unmuted you. Why don't you go ahead? Yes, hi, thank you. My question is, uh, with the discussions on the ACA possibly being dissolved in the immediate future, how do you see that impacting telehealth, if at all? I would just jump in to say, the, I mean, one of the most obvious impacts will be fewer people on Medicaid because states were allowed to expand their Medicaid um, as part of the ACA. And so I think that we will have a number of people who will potentially no longer, you know, states can't afford to roll that into, you know, the entire cost of that, um, of that population. We will have disenrollment of, um, of, uh, large numbers of people who will have um, insurance and therefore would be left out of the, you know, the telehealth space, but for, you know, if they're able to connect to like federally qualified health centers and others, I think um, that I think is one of the most immediate um, um, concerns I'd have, but I'd let my other um, 15 panelists weigh in on that. I think in the interest of time, we're gonna to go to the next question and it is from Iris Berman. And this one uh, looked like it was directed to Melinda. Iris, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, hi, um, I did have a question. I know you answered part of it um, in the chat. Uh, as far as your follow-up, if somebody does need in-person care of any type, but how are you documenting that care for the continuity? It's kind of related to some of the earlier questions and also, are, do you have hooks, if you do have that documentation system in place with the HIE so that that person's continuity of care is protected? So I think continuity of care is an issue no matter if you're talking about telemedicine or in person. I mean, I, you can have surgery at NYU and have your primary care be a part of Mount Sinai and there's no interoperability, there's no continuity of records across health systems. So. What we've tried to do is empower the patients to have access to their records. So it's very easy. The patient can um, either show their smartphone to their, uh, to their provider or they can download their record and send it to their provider or print it and take it in uh, to that in-person provider. We do work with a third-party vendor ribbon, which I put in the chat. Um, 
they have a real time up to date contact information, insurance plans, um, languages spoken, all the information that you need on providers. And so our uh, network of providers can help direct the care for patients who need to be seen in person. Um, we are still uh, working through solutions on how to get records from the in-person provider to row um, and thinking differently, again, giving that the power to the patient. So if the patients take pictures of their records right now, they could upload pictures onto our uh, platform. Um, our EHR is built completely in-house. So we can focus more on patient and provider workflows and not on billing or collections because everything is cash pay. So we are, um, we are working through that, but right now the easiest solution is to make it easy for the patient to carry their records from row uh, to the in-person provider. Thanks, Melinda. And then we have a question from uh, Rehan Faraqui for Laurel. Hi, Laurel. So I work at a remote patient monitoring company. I'm on the medical partnerships and sales team. And we do lots of outreach to outpatient practices in primary care and endocrinology. Uh, they rarely have heard these newer RPM billing codes and it actually shocks them. Did, did he get cut off or? I think he uh, uh, I think I read, I think I read, oh, here he comes. I think I read this in yes. the question. So sorry. Yeah. How do we ensure that, you know, CMS or are there associations that can, um, you know, spread this information to providers so they know that these new initiatives exist and that they can bill for them? Yeah, I was, I, I'm happy to address, I mean, as a plan, we obviously want our members to have access to this. And so we sent out provider newsletters and updates and actually even on the Metro Plus website, we have the like the, oh, you, oh, you can't see it because of the green screen. Um, but the, um, I, I was trying to show you on my phone, the grid of like what to bill for what and the telephonic reimbursement overview is like right and available on our website. And we try to direct members, um, I try to direct providers to it so that they're aware. And then if they, didn't, if they bill incorrectly, we're trying to work with them to teach them because we can be, and we could just like flat out deny people, but we could also say, okay, this is why it was denied, you were missing this. And we understand, you know, billing and coding sort of is what it is and it's, 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 the, it's the bear we all inherited. But the more that I think the payers can do to make sure that providers are aware, um, that's definitely something that we believe is not only something that's like good to do, that it's, you know, it's part of our responsibility to make sure that people know about these things. So that's at least one way that providers can come, um, that to become aware through, you know, information from their payers. That's great. So for us, as well. So for us, that um, we had to do the same thing. We had to educate as part of onboarding uh, the providers um, in, in telemedicine. We had to also do some training in terms of billing because it is very specific to telemedicine. Yeah. Well, those are two good answers, Rehan. I think that it's great to see Amanda as a plan taking initiative to do that education. And I think there are probably organizations, groups of physicians, physician organizations that can do that, as well as you have the American Telemedicine Association. So there's a lot of work to be done, to your point, to get the word out about this ability to be reimbursed for remote monitoring. Mm -hmm. And we're trying our best, you know, wherever we can touch people to let them know. Thank you all. And our last question is from Chris Chambers. Hey, all Chris? thanks. It's related to the HIE question, but in terms of thinking about a patient's quarterback of care, which is obviously a very important thing to maintaining longitudinal health of a member, how is that relationship handled today in terms of handing off from a telemedicine provider to an in-service provider? And then how do you see that shifting, again, in terms of thinking about a true quarterback point person for a patient? So, I remember if you can answer, but who wants to go first? I'll uh, quickly answer. I you know, unfortunately, I think um, technology sometimes, if we're not careful, is just going to replicate what we've we've done all along. It's the the solution is not going to come from telemedicine. We we need to be mindful of that and and how we hand those patients off. Some sometimes we have patients who come into our urgent care centers and they ask if they could come here uh, again for their you know blood pressure medic you know cation and their diabetes, and we we try to stare them, but really none of this is, is integrated. It's a larger problem that telemedicine is not necessarily going to fix, 
but we do need to be mindful of it. And especially if we make telemedicine very convenient, um, that um, we, we may just, could potentially make things worse. Yep. I was going to say, um, on the, we have the, some of the longitudinal care management that you mentioned, and we have made, um, we've imported into our care management software the, um, the telemedicine claims that have occurred through our vendor Amwell. And then also we have visibility on the claims overall, so we can see that it occurred. Now, seeing what happened is obviously the trickier part of it. And I think, I love your, I mean, I, I think really making sure that these encounters end up um, visible through the HIE infrastructure, especially in New York State, that we've got such a wealth, um, a wealth of health information exchanges is, a, is a, I think, a great suggestion. Well, we've already gone over. Um, obviously, we could continue talking for hours, um, but I want to thank you, Linda, for moderating. I want to thank Laurel, Eve, Melinda, and Amanda for being so open and honest about what's going on um, in all of your organizations. Um, and I want to thank the audience for staying on a little bit longer. For those of you who signed up for the post-event networking trial, we'll be on in a little in a couple of minutes. But thanks again and look forward to connecting with all of you soon.